tweet. Doodle, doodle, do. Tweeting community standard. Have you seen Wonder Woman yet? I'm assuming you have. Oh my god, it's so good. I've, 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 I, I think I need to take my, my little girl. You absolutely do. Yeah. So, like we've been we watching do. all the Marvel movies. We just finished. No, um, she's gonna, she's gonna get obsessed and she's gonna want to walk we around. We just finished Winter Soldier. That's where we are currently in the Marvel universe. Yeah. Um, but uh, oh, that's Wonder quite Woman a far back. Well, I mean, it's, it's like ten movies in, right? There's, but there's like sixteen of them or seventeen of them, right? Um, so yeah. Anyway, so uh, she watches a lot of Marvel and DC cartoons. Um, I think she'd be really into Wonder Woman. Yeah, I should. I should really. Uh, I should do that. I should take her. I see a lot of people like taking five year old girls and not batting an eyelid. So she's eight. I'm sure she'll be fine. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it's, it's like all the other cartoon, cartoon violence. It's fantasy comic book violence type stuff, right? It's no different to the others, I'm guessing. Yeah, there's a whole conversation about how Americans don't sweat that kind of stuff. There were, yeah, babies in movies like that. Yeah, yeah it's funny, isn't it? It All is right. uh, different. Okay, so let's... Uh, well, we have 92 people already. That's crazy. It's been a while since... I've been on at least. We it had we had a couple of weeks off completely, right? We were away for three weeks, and then you were here, right, last week. Last crashed. week, I was in Atlanta. Oh, then we were off last week. The week before that, you were here, and you, like, dragged people in. Yes, yeah. that was interesting. So last week, I, I was um, – a couple weeks ago, I was up there, and uh, we had a bug in, in the um, – the bug was when you run .NET Restore and you have an invalid NuGet feed configured as a custom feed and it fails yes. or it doesn't exist, Yes, that the, the Restore can't get the full closure, so it freaks out and fails. But it doesn't pass the uh, – it was putting it out to standard out instead of standard error. Ah, so it doesn't and it never got out build or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So And, and there's no way to debug it. Uh, mm. So Lebetsky, Mike Lebetsky, I was happened to be walking by, so he I pulled him into the room and he we I, we fixed that. <laughs> and then oh, and then were you there when we fixed the ANSI console bug? No. Oh, dude. So check this out. Let me share my screen. This was super interesting to me. Uh, do do do. Let me know when you can see. Yep, I can see now. Okay, so. We there's a bug that has been bugging me for forever, at right? least at least a year. Okay. And the bug is this: if you have your colors and such, now this isn't going to work. We'll try. I've got um, a new. I'm trying out a new. Yeah, a new color this, style. Yep, the solo stuff. Okay, so I've got a random build that's a couple weeks old on this machine, right? Yep. Yep. You go like, yeah. So I'm not actually seeing it because the bug is. If you the the bug was, if you have a color that is bright. Actually, that may have been fixed on that build. If you have a uh, let's try this. Where's my where's my global JSON? I'd like this is how you, able this to is how you create a, a global JSON. This is how I create a global JSON is you Google yourself. <laughs> um, I'm, re I'm thinking that I would like to have a global JSON template. Why can't like, you just do a new global JSON? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Uh, and a new global JSON. Yeah, and it should just burn in the current SDK version for whatever you ran .NET new with, and you that's can go and change it. Actually, pretty interesting. We should just submit that to .NET templating like this week. OK, good idea. OK, so write that down. So I'll pick 104. I can recreate the bug because it's been a nightmare. Yeah. .net dash dash version. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is a and this is unrelated bug. This will fail on this machine. Right. It'll get, get all the way to the end, end, and then there's a central file. And then it'll file say fail and prime the pump. Yeah. Do you know what this is? Yeah. I I, I think I'm aware of it. Um, yeah, I couldn't thing. find the bug number. Yeah, no, I think this got fixed. Um, you can two O thing. 
keep yeah, all it's, messed it's, up. It's to a, yeah, yeah. It's to do. Yeah, it's okay. something to do with it. But you know that someone's on that. I, I my understanding is it it has been resolved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this isn't the, the, for some reason because I've gone and boogered up my colors. Yeah. It's not happening. But let me show you where the where the bug is. So I I put this bug in. At least, I've been fighting about this one for a while. This was opened yeah. in November. There's at least 10 different duplicates, okay? Okay. So almost six months ago. Mm -hmm. Here's what it looks like. You have a bright color. Yes. You, you, it, it goes and puts a bright red. Yes. And then restores back a light color. A dark oh, color. Oh, interesting. Okay. So the issue is that when you are in your DOS box, your your command prompt, mm -hmm. and this is I've been like steeped in this bug. If you go to colors, notice how the lo the lower bits, the lower left side, yes. yes, are the dark versions of the right side. Oh wow, I didn't realize that. Okay, are they? Yeah, really. So they they are they are. So um, are they not uh, in order though? They they are in order. Uh, color. Oh. Properties, command prompt, windows. Wow, then I am not seeing that at all. Yeah, yeah. So, at so if you look. You mean by default? Yes, look. Oh, by default, yours By default, it? yeah, mine are is goofy. It? This is magenta. Yeah. This is not another color. It's, it's magenta intensity. with the intensity bit set. Got it. Got it. Okay. The intensity bit can be called light or okay. bold. So this I is see. red and bold red. Green okay. and bold green, blue and, this and bold. This is a Windows blue. concept. This is a Windows thing from okay. thirty years ago. Okay. Okay. So, so what happens was, if an error happens, they we fail to reset the bold, and I see. my dark, my bright green turns to dark green. Okay. So this gets punted for a while because yeah. there's no good repro. Yeah. But I felt like I had pointed to the lines. I actually went out of my way. No. to point to the here's the problem All right okay and this is where open source and also where what i blame myself for this bug is what i'm saying yeah i pointed to the line yes in december yes but what did i not do didn't send a pull, I didn't pull do request the PR. yeah right because and this is an interesting perspective also i couldn't get the thing to build ah yes because I wanted to build the CLI about. in order to build yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. They want to make it exactly. easier. In, or, in order to build the CLI, I, can, I could have put it in, but I would have been putting in a blind PR without ever testing it. Right. See? Yeah. And I found the line in December. Okay. So we go back and forth, and then another gentleman comes in and has some 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 thoughts. And it's mm -hmm. not perfect, not right, but at yes. least they're, they're trying. Yes. Okay. And they come, they, you know, so they, they give some tries. And I say, good job. Then they come up with some alternates. Again, it and it's been being punted now for, for yeah, months and yeah, months and months. Yeah. Mike, very nice person. I find him to be extremely kind, very patient. Mike happens to be in the hallway. He solves the bug, the other totally unrelated bug about yes. the .NET CLI. And I say, hey, Mike, I never could get this to build on my machine. Do you have this building on your machine? And Mike's like, oh, yeah. Right? So nice. then we sit next to your desk. Actually, I yeah. think you were sitting on your desk. You may have been gone. <laughs> I wasn't there, yeah. This is my... Here, see? Hooray! Nice. I thought I had it. Oops, not correct. I got confused. So then, <laughs> Mike, Mike and I sit down, and we go and go over this, and I wrote about, I don't know, 10 lines of code, yeah. which was an if, you know, such a state management thing. Yeah. Mike, in his genius, throws my yeah. code away. Right. And writes one line. Yes. A single because I had like an if then else. Yeah, with a B has, has a bitwise operation in there. He's got a bitwise operation. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, which is what he just does without even thinking yeah, while I'm like do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. cleaner. So yeah, the nice. point is, what was happening was he was never if I if I open these expansions here, this line right here, we, someone sets the color to bold. Yeah. That is the current state of the boldness. It was never, it had no initial state. I see. So the initial state was not bold. So right. it returns you to the initial state. So the fix is keep track of what intensity is 
yeah. save the initial state, and right. problem solved. Right. And six-month-old bug goes. But yeah. the root issue here is that I knew that, yes, but ha could not build the thing. Right. And, and that's something that, that, that they're aware of, and they want to. They're trying to improve the yeah, the ease for new people to come and like build stuff, right? Exactly. But apparently, that's like a really important thing. It is yeah. clone and build should be possible. Yes. yes. So, um, yeah, the the the, the uh, getting if we fix that, that would be great. So then I thought was really cool. Uh, it just is just for people to maybe understand how the software gets made. Mm. Mike, of course, then says, "Hey, .NET bot, test this." Yeah, which I thought was cool. Then you always have two people eyeballing these things, right? Mm -hmm. So Mike does the work, Lavar looks at the work, and you know makes sure the changes are good. Then he says, "When do we want this?" Yeah, that's a punt. That's a punt. Yeah, I say, for Pete's sake, no. <laughs> Give it to me yesterday. <laughs> then he says, "Okay, retarget it for two o." Yeah, you see it move to two o. Mike fills out a form. Yeah. This is the part that I think, and again, this is great for the audience to understand. Characterize potential risks. Yes, and that's well, because we're in a, it, we've talked about it before. Like you can see at the top, it says ask mode approval. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 2.0 is in a stage where we're beyond the ability for develop. Like you're not allowed just to check changes in anymore, right? Right. Um, you have to get, you have to justify why you want to make a code change because we're in a heavy period of stabilization and verification. Um, and so they have a th what's called an ask mode template, which is what this is. He's filling in here, so mm -hmm. that when it goes to Matt Gertz is the is the gentleman who sort of owns all up the engineering side of the .NET tooling, uh, which of course the SDK and CLI is a part of. And so he wants to see the justification for why are we taking a code fix now that we've entered this phase. Um, what is the impact if we don't take it, et cetera, et cetera. And so yeah, so like usually if you're in like an open period, um, this would just get fixed and it's fine. Um, but now that we're in this period of like we only have you know n weeks left where we're able to take any fixes at all, we're very cognizant of what those fixes are, and we have to assess their impact. Right. So he points out um, that well, what's the nightmare scenario? Yeah. Well, assuming no null reference exceptions, mm -hmm. it's uh, <clears throat> it doesn't work at all, and it either comes out in bold or maybe now it stays bold. Yeah. And how do we test it? We've manually verified it. Yeah. Then he tells the boss, tells .NET bot more specifically, well, test down, you know, more, more, more stuff. This is what I thought was really cool. <laughs> boss says, hey, man, that's, that's accessibility. Yep. So see, and, uh, and that, that's, that's part of the game. Like it is like finding a tenant or a pillar, which I'm using all the terms that are used internally. Um, right. To, to align a, an ask mode fix with. Because it's much easier to approve a fix if you can demonstrate that, well, this aligns with the fact that we 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 strive and we would desire and we are required to make our products accessible. And if right. we muck around with the fonts and leave them in a bad state, that impacts the accessibility of the product. Exactly. exactly. And so like it's very so, easy to fix that. This is a great example and a learning experience. But at the same time, it does speak to some issues with open source where and also the sense of ownership you yeah. know who owns something like that the other issue is that this isn't happening to everyone this wasn't a bug that affected everyone right it only affected people who manually changed their mm -hmm. colors to bold so it was Which, an it was a by definition a, 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 a little edgy right little, little edgy, edgy. Yeah. little edgy but also um like here like there's a Here's a, a, a pull request that's been open for three months. Yeah. You know, yep. it's and, small. And, 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 that's, and that's actually, uh, and that, that, that uh, lag or the, the how stale pull requests can get um, changes from repo to repo because, you know, a lot of the repos are managed by different teams and right. different teams. And this one's actually not that bad. I mean, that's not, this is uh, a non. That's pretty good. You know, I can, if you look at some of the ASP.NET repos, I can tell you straight off the bat, some of them are uh, horrible in that regard. We have some, some of them have pull requests that have been open for more than a year. Um, and the problem is you close it and you've really just thrown someone's work away. Well, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the problem. I think the problem is like, go back and just ask the question, like, why has it been open a year? Like, if we're just going to be completely blunt and honest, like, uh, under what circumstances is that really reasonable? Like, if, if we had no intention 
of supporting it or, or taking that in now, why didn't we just close it and say, hey, we, we don't have any intention of doing this in the perceived future right. for the next milestones we're currently planning. Uh, pil- please feel free to log an issue where we can discuss this for longer term type stuff. But like leaving it open and just kind of dragging it out and potentially uh, misleading or miscommunicating expectations and things, I don't really think helps anybody, right? Like, Yes, it, definitely. Leaving yeah. someone on is not okay, but also right. sending pull requests without asking is another question. Yeah, and I mean, that, that depends on the, the, the scope. And my general guidance would be if you think this is something that is going to warrant discussion, um, then you should open an issue first. If it's, right if it's literally like I, I'm spelled, I, I fixed a spelling mistake in one of the doc comments, or I, you know, then they just send the pull request. That's fine. If, it, if, if it's anything that will change behavior, you should, pr- you should probably always log a bug first or log an issue, whether it's a feature enhancement or a bug, and detail it there. And then you can send the PR immediately and link it back. And that's the best of all scenarios. Like you logged a bug, and then in the bug, it has a reference saying there's a PR that fixes this. Um, yep. Like that's going to get you. That's like the best open source citizen you could you could possibly be. Um, this is great. But like you know, bigger features obviously obviously take a lot more time and they require coordination with the team. Like you can't just. It's certainly not good etiquette to drop a new five thousand line or even thousand line feature into a product and just expect that you know if you because you wanted it and you coded it that we should just accept it because the cost of maintaining that is is infinite. Like it goes forever. Like once it's in the code base, we have to care about it forever more. And we have to think about how it interplays with anything else we may have planned to do in the future, things we haven't thought of yet. Um, and there's a support burden where once the API is there, like, you know, deprecating API isn't straightforward. Like there's there's a process we have to go through. So yeah, yep. it's yeah, uh, all the stuff that people I think are aware of generally. Yeah. So that was yeah. fun and interesting. Yeah. And I found that to be uh, super useful. That's cool. I had some. We haven't spoken on the air for a while, like you and I. It's been over a month, so I had some geeking out to catch up on. If, if that's if if you are, uh, please go ahead. So I have a list. <laughs> so okay, you got? saw this list. I think looking at our calendar here. Hang on, I'm just making sure. I've got a hard stop at eleven, but let's go. So I saw it. So like uh, SNES Classic. You saw that was announced yesterday. Oh now, yeah, I know, NES Classic. 80, I know that uh, you it's, kind have, of, uh, like, it's only got twenty five games though. It's quite twenty one, I think. Like I have the NES Classic. I was lucky enough to get one of those, and I really enjoy it. It's just like it's just so easy. I push a button, and I play the game, and I didn't have to set up a Raspberry Pi or buy an emulator or anything. I, I and I kind of enjoy just the geekiness of the little form factor and stuff too. So I, I'm definitely going to try and get a SNES Classic. That's going to be that's going to be cool. Although growing up in Australia, the SNES looked different to me than it does to you because the US had a unique. SNES design. The rest of the world had the that's Famicom, true. the Japanese design. So I kind of wish I could get that version, but that's all right. You know, I'll, I'll take what I can get here. Um, the Amplify. I know that you. I I I run the Amplify Wi-Fi equipment at home. Um, the mesh from Ubiquity Networks. You I have the same. We have the same one now. We have exactly the same one. So I put mine in months ago. The Amplify HD, which is their top of the range um, one, which is, I think is the one you got as well. Um, the, I'm, yeah. I'm no. wondering how, how it's, how it's going for you. Okay. It's, it's, it's going well for you. Because I, I, yes, I, like so, you, have okay. gone through a number of routers. Like, this is my fifth router since I've moved to the well, US. OK, let's be, let's be frank. One moment. <laughs> yep. And if I was in my office at home, I'd be doing the same thing. They're on my floor, all the old ones. Well, because I need to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, and I want to clear them out because I don't want to give out my password. So if I can't yeah. put, take them to goodwill until yes. I reset them all, I was going to sell them on Amazon. Amazon Trade In will give you like fifty bucks for anything that's like a recent router in the last few years. I found maybe some of them Research? will give you'll give you more. Yeah, like I, yeah, I looked I at mean, the Trade In site yesterday. Kind of scratched. I mean, I'm not yeah, get 50 I mean, bucks sure, sure, that's true. You think I can get fifty bucks for one of these? Well, like my my link says my WIT nineteen hundred AC, I can get like fifty bucks. Do I need more. the box? No, you're lying. Know. No, like I mean, I looked at the site last night briefly. I've traded in stuff on Amazon huh. before and got money. Okay, um, all right, I'll give it a try. Okay, so this is the net. This is my first one. Netflix N six hundred, my first N router. Okay, worked great. Had it within fifty feet of the room. Yep. Everything is cool. Keeping in mind that my ha- it's also my first five gigahertz router. Mm. Five gigahertz makes all the difference if you don't have a lot of walls between you and the. Uh, and yeah. the router. Oh, hang on, I'm hearing myself now. Sorry, that was me opening the YouTube chat. I had so it yet. that was my first five gigahertz. Lovely. Then I got the Linksys 1900 AC. Is this what you have? Yes. Yep. Super powerhouse. Little. This was the one that was supposed to be the return 
of the WRT54 that everyone yes. loves, the, the kind of the most loved router of all time to yes. this day, still a fantastic router uh, because it's a Linux machine. Right. Unfortunately, Linux has had all kinds of problems and didn't release the source code, didn't yep. play kindly with open source, and nothing interesting has happened to this router like as much as it did with the WRT54G. Well, I think they actually ended up releasing another model called the open source version of that. They, and they that completely screwed it up. Which was for the you know W with the DDR DDRIT what was it DDR WRT yeah that thing yeah yeah so I used to run open source oh okay uh, router hardware uh, software on my old hardware the point was that this was supposed to be like a super powerful version of that the supercharged version of that they failed um, these are all adequate but I always had dead spots I couldn't um, stream uh, from, you know, another, like I have other rooms that I might want to stream in. The kids couldn't use the iPad in the playroom. Then I got this, which was the, this is my favorite router of all time right now. The Archer 32,000, 3200. This is the, the TP link. Yeah, this is the one. Well. Oh yeah, it's glorious. And this is the one that my wife thought was a lovely coffee table. <laughs> yeah. She, <laughs> Comes she with legs. It. She put it like that. It's meant yeah. to be like this. Um, and this thing, Darn near got all corners, yeah. But still, there were dead spots, uh, and I'm not saying that I dead spots in that like I walked around the house doing Netflix on an iPad because no one does that. I'm talking about like legitimate dead dead spots where my wife would be in her office trying to move the laptop like a UHF. Oh, really? And I was just like, it was fine in 80% of the house, but it was annoying enough where it's like, hey, what's going on? I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I can't get Wi-Fi. Uh, mostly going through walls big walls concrete walls that was the mm. problem yep so then troy hunt god bless him mm -hmm. genius that he is says i should get this thing called ubiquity networks yep and and, and 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 all kinds of professional fancy people on twitter were like you need a ubiquity network so i go online and i google it with bing and it says uh enterprise grade uh ap's access points and it has pictures of like uh, sports stadiums. Yeah, this is what you use to get great Wi-Fi to sports stadium, which, by the way, is not known for great Wi-Fi. Um, and and every single time I said I want, I think I might get a mesh network. People are like, Yeah, you should get you should get unified by ubiquity, ubiquity networks. Yeah, I'm gonna spend five hundred bucks on an enterprise AP, and I'm like, Yeah, but look at all the stats. Don't need the stats. <laughs> uh, but look at all the don't need any of that stuff like what no one can give me an answer like why enterprise grade is better it's a freaking house so you would said amplify amplify is unit ubiquity it's made by it's ubiquity their, it's their prosumer uh, yeah. version so i uh i've got an app on my phone are you using the app you have an android right yeah I, i'm using the app yep so, so i've got the app on my phone and it says yep. hey, everything is great yeah, and I've got hundred percent. Those are the little meshies, the little mesh dealies, the little antennas at the bottom. There. I don't know why it's not. There you go. Yep. There you go. Got the little mesh at the bottom there, and it says everything is great. What's cool is that I can then go under family, and there's a thing that says kids. Yep. And I can just pause it. See, it says yep. kids three devices. Yeah. Additionally, notice that it's got Scott's iPhone. Yes. Five gigahertz. And you see the little YouTube icon there? Where's that? It's, it's prioritized for streaming. Oh, so you click on it. Look that. at this. Isn't it? Oh, that's so nice. It says optimized, optimized for, streaming. for streaming. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus optimized for whatever. Like, well, yeah. And then I can go back here and you can take a look at my, my internet right now. Mm -hmm. Talking to you. Yeah. Look, it's a real see, time of what you're doing. So yeah, downloading upload, 20 megabits. Download <laughs> 2 megabits, upload 4 megabits, 25 clients connected. Yeah. It's just that's about the most polished thing I've ever seen. It's very nice. Absolutely impressed, and it's getting better as it gets updated. So I will do a blog post about that. So I feel like, with respect to Troy, who has a bigger, bigger house, and he wants to get you know access in, in the mm. what do you call it in the back down room, back backyard, or whatever on, down on at the, the on the pier where he's jet ski as well. On the pier, yes, on his dock. Yes. Um, I don't do sports ball, so I don't have that problem. Um, <laughs> It's pretty freaking amazing. So far, uh, it took it took more time to run around and set up new Wi-Fi on all the different devices than it did to set the thing up. Yeah, I literally just yeah, no, I, 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 and then also with mine. dealing with the. Uh, did you change your IP addresses? 
I find that when switching routers, picking I another, another I let range. It, I let it do its default, so it changed the the local sort of netted range from what I had yeah. previously. And so the biggest the biggest pain was just doing things like reserving IP addresses for the printers and stuff again. Otherwise, they, you know, the printers stop working every week when the lease changes and you get a different IP address and no one's printer stuff. Well, yeah. Or getting all that stuff going again was just the, the normal crap. But it's it's been really good. It's been rock solid. I haven't had any sort of like downtime issue with it, with, with it or anything, never had to reset it or anything like that. And as you said, they've been updating the app and the firmware. Mm -hmm. And oh, the little cube has a display. And when there's firmware available, I have it in my wardrobe. Um, like it, it comes up on the display and says, oh, there's a firmware update available for the device. And it's a touch screen. So you can just say, yeah, update it now, please. And it'll update it there on the fly for you, rather than you mm -hmm. having to remember to go and like, oh, I better check to see if my firmware on my router is, you know, it, it has, has an update. Like it, it actually prompts you. And so you just see it like when it's, when you walk past and happen to see it, it's like, oh yeah, I'll push that and updates. It's great. It's been really, really yeah. good. So I'm, I was impressed. I plugged the thing in, it said 1.4 upgrade available. I pushed a button, it was 2.0. And then that yeah. kid's feature showed up. Showed yeah. up. yeah. That's part of it. So and like definitely. I acknowledge the, the Unify stuff from Ubiquity. Um, it has a lot more features, right? No, and I acknowledge that it's better. I get but that. It, it, it's it, you know, and and it does have a very it nice management it's... suite. But you have to you have to you have to manage it, and you have to get a, a management key, or you have to run Java. And generally, to get the most out of it, you have to get their secure gateway product and a couple of access points. Like you I mean, you're looking at sinking, um, you know, a few more than a few hundred dollars generally to do it well. Right. Now they have and, a lot of and... really interesting products in the Unify range. They have an in wall point access point now. So like you can take a power or like a cat six wall point and then you can mount an right. access point like right on it and That's keep the cable that that. he did that in his in his brother's house, I think it was, and he's in their new yeah. house. And so the, those and those points are less than a hundred dollars each. And so you can you can put like those put a few of them around the house to either to be your primary Wi Fi or to supplement Wi Fi in various places. But the Unify range that they have goes from like that level of access point all the way to like the stadium multi-mile bridging radio stuff. Um, and it all uses the same management stuff. So like yeah, if, if you need that type of stuff or if that interests you, or if you want to do things like VPNs and all that type of stuff, then yeah, then you should look at something like the uh, the Ubiqu the Unify stuff. But I'm I'm very happy with the Amplify. It's been great. I am, uh, we are getting a bunch of evil chatbots. Yeah, I know. I'm just hitting report on every message as it comes in. And what is your, um, what is your, I, 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 I'm trying to add you as a moderator so you can do it yourself. Oh, that'd be We good. added another person named Damien Edwards. That is not you. They What's did? your, what are you logged in as? Are you logged in as Microsoft or as somebody else? Uh, let me just go back to the window and I will triple check. Cause I, I have two, Damien, Damien I have two Google accounts. So I'm at demo.p.edwards. That one. Emo dot p dot Edwards. Like that's my email address. No channel match is found. Oh well, the the display name is just Damien Edwards, but that's the. You're an admin though, right? You can like kick users. I am, but yeah, but I also am talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it makes it hard, doesn't it? Um, so while you're doing that, the um. The, you weren't here when Intel announced all the new CPUs, and I would usually rib on you when that happens because you're running your hexacore from 400 years ago that requires a nuclear power reactor to run. Um, I know, but they now have the core i9. Have you seen this? There's an i9 now? So, I, okay, you brace yourself. Brace yourself. There's a new motherboard chipset called the X299, and this runs the Skylake E or Kaby Lake E processors. The Skylake E processors go all the way. They start at um, six cores. They go all the way to eighteen cores. Oy vey. With and then you add hyperthreadings. But for the, the the sweet spot is the ten core CPU at nine hundred ninety nine dollars, which comes with all PCI Express lanes unlocked, um, and drops into this new X ninety nine motherboard. So I know a lot of people have been waiting for this new generation of chipset and motherboard socket and uh, these 13 megabyte cache. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty crazy. Um, they have a new turbo boost as well so they can now max clock two of the cores instead of just one. Hmm. So you can get like two cores going at over 4 gigahertz in this form factor. I think it's a 140 watt TDB chip uh, so t TDP I so I think know. it's about the same as yours but you're getting an awful lot more power, obviously. Right, right. I know that you've teased me because I say that I have an i7. Yes. Um, 
You have because, like a Conroe or a Penryn well, generation. I have the first i7. Yeah. But it's still, it's still, I mean, again, we've argued about this oh, lowercase a, but I've got, I run VR, I've got three oh, monitors, geez. I yeah. play games at fully 4X. You know, I have no problems with this. this oh, thing. then you're fine. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's just that you've had to add expansion cards for things like USB 3. I've had to add, I've had to add expansion cards. And, and to your point, it probably uses double or triple the power it needs yeah. to. Yeah. So, but to but your I, point, it, I, it's I worth noting this is, this is just a decent generational change, I think. Like, they finally now have. A, a new range of of chips with a like a, a, a magnitude, not a magnitude, but like the, a multiple jump in core count, which you right. know, the most you would really get before was six before you went to Xeon, and then you would might get eight and those and above in workstation CPUs. But these are just enthusiast CPUs, and you can get you know up to eighteen. I think the eighteen core chip costs two grand, but the ten core chip is a thousand dollars. And last year, a thousand dollars would only buy you. Um, I think I think last year their 10 core chip was two thousand dollars. So basically, in less than 12 months, they've half the price of the 10 core chip. Plus, it's a new platform, so you have a whole bunch of new features. So, I thought right. that was pretty cool. That was another cool. way to look at it. Is I have an i7 and an i9 just came out, so it's two better. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what marketing and Intel wants you to think. <laughs> no, but I couldn't. I couldn't justify psychologically getting an i7 no. again. No, I totally. Now there's an i9. Like, why would you? There's an i9. It's but what's <laughs> too better? And, and yeah, that that socket does go down to i7. They have a new range of i7s, which are their like their E edition i7. So you can get like a quad core that'll go in the X299 socket, um, right. or on the chipset motherboards. That's about the same price as a normal i7. But then you can obviously upgrade to the much better chips later if you want to. Um, the other thing they did announce is that there was a, I don't know if it was leaked or announced, but they're talking about quad core. Um, 15 watt mobile CPUs by the end of the year in the next year, like the eighth gen post KB Lake. Um, they're talking mm -hmm. about having quad core, so something in a, like a Surface Pro or a Surface Book or any Ultra Book would be, finally be able to get a quad core CPU. So I'm super looking forward to seeing what they uh, what the vendors do with that type of SKU as well, which is pretty cool. Um, Interesting. I built I'm going to wait a couple. I, I can't. I can't spend a thousand dollars on no, a no, no, no. Processor. Like it, it's nice to keep up with these things so that you can pick the time, the moment in time when you think it's ready for you to jump and go to that whatever the new gen is. Right. I um. I built the Lego Saturn V rocket. Did you see that? You did. Yeah. So I got it. I was lucky enough to get the the Lego Saturn V. I think I don't even think you can back order it now. I think it's. I'm not sure if they're going to. Hopefully, they'll do another run. Uh, it is amazing. So it's 1,969 pieces as an homage to obviously the year 1969. Um, and I built it with my kids. And it was probably, mm -hmm. I don't know, seven or eight hours total build with the three of us uh, over a few days. Um, but the thing is a meter tall. Like like when it's built, it's a full meter tall. All the stages is separate. Is it dangerous? No, well, no, it's incredibly solid. Like it's amazingly, like miraculously solid. Um, you can hold it with one hand and the stages don't fall off or anything. And then it comes with a lunar module and a lamb and a lander and then you know they fit inside the rocket and it comes with mini like micro figs. So it's it's basically to scale. So they've got these ridiculously tiny little astronauts. Um, it is beautifully, beautifully designed though. There are some incredible details in the way they do the internal structure and then the cladding on the rocket. It's really, really nice. It's a, it was a really enjoyable build. And I haven't built a, like a complicated Lego model in ye like 20 years. So hmm. I really enjoyed it. It was really good fun. And I've started on the tower bridge because I know you build Lego. I built the like tower bridge and I will tell you, I built the whole thing. It was glorious. I looked at it and then I realized I have nowhere to put it and I sold it. Yeah. So like I, I didn't buy it. I'm borrowing it from Alan, you know, the dev manager here. So oh, he, he has a lot of them. So I'm borrowing his tower bridge and I'm going to build it over summer and then I'll just give it back. But I'm working like... on this. Okay. This oh, you got this one of the. Uh, you got a few of those, right? You got the the harem, and this is the I've quickie got, mart. This is the quickie mart. <laughs> That's great. And um, yeah, it's 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 the detail. Yeah. It's like specific episodes. I mean, it's it's totally oh, really? insane. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that looks like fun. Oh, like this fun. is much more fun than work. It is. The only other thing I was, I was like, talk you? about bugs. Well, I'm going to do. I've got some updates I want to supply, but right, let's I, get I'm that catching done. up and geek up. Um, okay, so today, I think today is the one year anniversary of .NET Core 1.0 being released. I think one is year it? today, you were on stage at the Red Hat conference. I remember that launching launching .NET Core 1.0 runtime. 
you know, last year. We didn't have the tooling ready yet, but we we launched the runtime. Um, the other thing is VS 15.3 Preview 3 is out today. So I got that uh, update through Which the one? public channel. 15.3 uh, Preview 3 is out today. So if you're on the VS Preview, the public preview channel. So if you're okay. just on normal VS 2017, you're on 15.2.1 or something. Okay. Um, if you're on the VS Preview or you have installed that side by side, yeah, let me check that. then uh, 15.3 15, Preview 3, it was previously Preview 2 of 15.3, um, came out today, uh, which I installed this morning. Um, and then .NET Core 2, uh, preview 2, I mean, they're different products, so they all have different version numbers, I'm sorry. Um, .NET Core 2, Preview 2, uh, we're hoping will go out this week. So there's a meeting in 17 minutes where we'll talk about whether we're ready to do that or not. Um, but verification, as I understand it, has been finished. So we're now just have to turn the crank to actually get all the bits staged on the download servers and deploy to Azure and all that type of stuff before we can you know, get on NuGet and all that stuff before we can announce it. Um, but hopefully that will happen this week. So the, the next preview of .NET Core and ASP.NET Core 2 is imminent. And then, um, and then uh, th that means that .NET Core 2, the final version, is what we're currently working on. And so you know, going back to what we, we, we led the episode with, talking about the bug that you guys fixed a couple of weeks ago and talking about that ask mode stuff, um, that's where we're at. Like We're right at the end of finishing all the last bugs uh, that we have in .NET Core both the SDK and the runtime and the framework and ASP.NET Core and all the yada yada, yada all that stuff, um, so that we can get you a, a quality 2.0 release in the next couple of months. So yeah, so that that's my updates I had on that. Plus the signaler design work continues. I just want to you know, keep what, reiterating. What did David Fowler had an, uh, a very a tweet cryptic last tweet night that about full inception. inception. What is he talking about? So uh, as we've been sort of looking at the signaler design as part of .NET Core. Um, we're trying to expand what Signaler is beyond just the typical sort of real-time web stuff. We have aspirations to go beyond HTTP and just have a nice core set of abstractions for server and connection programming in general. And then we build the typical um, hubs mentality that people are used to in Signaler on top of that. Um, we talked about this, uh, David and I talked about this in our build talk this year. Um, we have this thing called ASP.NET Core Sockets, which sits at the bottom, and then Signaler and Hubs sits on top of that. What he realized yesterday, um, or over the weekend, was that it, he can really boil it down to just a couple of primitives. Um, yeah, oh, so you're yeah. not, oh, yeah, so you got the update button. Yep. So I'll do, that while, we're, I'll nice. do that while we're doing this. So, yeah. Did you see um, this, by the way? What's that? GPU, oh. Oh, are you, oh, you're running a, a nightly of some sort, aren't you? No, no. This is the public, public well, release. Well, hang oh, on. What do you oh, mean? Well, I'm running the... You're running Insider. Insider. But the point yeah. is, it's got GPU. Ah, yeah, so I, don't, I, don't run, I don't run the Insider builds. That is cool, though. So you've got, like, what is it doing right now? How hard is yeah. it working? How much memory is it using? Think about how much easier it's going to be to figure this stuff out now. Yeah, that so is then fantastic. you can go here and you can see if Skype is like we can see that we're not using the GPU to do what we're doing yeah. right now. Yeah, right. Oh, that's fantastic. So there's like the that. Visual Studio installer, and that'll be done in a second, and we'll be able to look at it. So I'm updating. This is this is the new for people who should not be afraid of 2017. Yeah. yeah. Uh, while Damien is talking, I'll be updating, and I'll be done in a minute, and yep. that's how fast it is. So it's good, and it's, and it and it can be so. I mean, you're only running one install, but you can only run it one. side by side. You can run it side by side with the the public RTM release of Visual Studio 2017. Why do I have only preview stuff? Did I get this because from I some think, preview place? I I think because the installer that you acquired came from the preview channel. It's only yeah. making available to you on this screen the preview channel. SKUs, you can mm. still go and download the non-preview one, and then it will show up inside. Oh, and then it would well. be the next. It'll be next. Yeah, so my it, it service doesn't. Book, I've got. Right, it doesn't blast them all at you all the time. It kind of only exposes what you've previously exposed yourself to. If that makes sense. I see. Okay. Um. So yeah. So the signal stuff. What he did is he came to a realization that uh, there's there's really only a, a very small number of core abstractions that represent the signal uh, protocol and programming model. Um, that can be shared between server, client, peer-to-peer, -peer, all of them. So you kind of basically just have this eye connection thing, and then you uh, point it. Uh, you point it at, a, at, at an endpoint, and it doesn't matter whether you're on the client or on the server, or you're on the server trying to talk to a scale-out provider, or you're in a what would traditionally be a signal client 
talking to a signaler server, but you want to change the signaler server with some other server, as long as you can speak through the eye connection abstraction, um, then it's the same code everywhere. And that's kind of what he realized. And so uh, we're now trending toward this place where, where you, know, you use the signaler client on the server and in the client. Like it, it's basically a duplex uh, uh, connection protocol. And so you use mm -hmm. the same code in both places. Um, and if you want to talk via Redis between two signaler servers, then you simply implement the signaler eye connection abstraction using Redis behind the scenes. Both sides still think they're talking to signaler endpoints because they are, it's just that it's being transferred through Redis. Um, so that's what he meant by inception. Is it's like it's like signaler built on signaler built on signaler built on signaler. Um, so he's currently we're currently working through whether that's feasible, but certainly it, it looks like a pretty cool breakthrough that it'll simplify a lot of the layering um, of the things through those models. So and allow a lot of flexibility because you can very easily now just point an app written towards the Signaler API at various things as long as you have that sort of interop in place. So which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> What else is going on? Uh, we had some conferences. So like we were away, like I was at NDC Oslo. We did a, a new iteration of our ASP.NET Core workshop, uh, me, uh, David Fowler, and John Galloway. And that was good. It was uh -huh. a new model. It was for ASP.NET Core 2. We built an app over two days. Rather than just like teaching features, we, we, we built an app from end to end. It was really, I thought it went really, really well. Um, the what app did you build? What app? It was a conference planner. And so we basically built a version of the NDC website where you have an agenda and speakers and you can log in and then make your own personal agenda. And there's an admin screen so admins can log in and you know edit sessions and all that type of stuff. And we, we purposely separated the app into a back end that was a web API and a front end that was a Razor Pages app so that we had that separation and we could teach all those features. And that it also mm -hmm. meant that you can then go and add like a spa that talks to the back end, or you can add a Xamarin app that talks to the back end. And so we forcibly separated it to make it more complicated so that we could show all the features that we have or lack of features, the things you have to solve as soon as you, you know, you aren't just doing a demo app, like as soon as you're doing something a little bit more real. So that was really good. It worked really well. And that's that's the format that we'll be using for the upcoming iterations of that workshop too. When I go to NDC Sydney, I'll be teaching that with Barry Dorans. Um, and I think uh, there's uh, Dev Intersections Europe and Dev Intersections Las Vegas is coming up as well. And I think we've got some people going to those. And there might be some workshops going on there as well, being taught by us as well. So I was at I was in Atlanta uh, at WeRise.tech. We rise tech, like mm -hmm. tech is the top level domain. It was a pretty cool uh, women in tech conference. Had five hundred. It was interesting. I was one of three guys. Uh, there was five hundred talented female engineers, and saw some amazing talks. And um, that was cool to be on the flip side. I will be in Montreal on the fourth of July at Dev Teach. So if any Canadians are around, oh, what are you doing, man? Sorry. <laughs> that, uh, is that, is that the YouTube? <laughs> no, yeah, basically. I was replying to someone in the chat, and uh, it, started. It, it required me to open a different yeah, yeah, tab yeah. to do something like that. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be in Montreal if there's any Canadians around that are going to be there, and then I'll be at VS Live in Redmond on the 15th of uh, August. Cool. So a couple things going on. Cool. Um, so what else I was going to say? Um, Another thing that was interesting at NDC Oslo was Steve Sanderson, our very good friend and work colleague, mm -hmm. uh, did an amazing demonstration where he, in the, basically over the span of 10 nights, got a version of .NET running in the browser on WebAssembly um, and including Razor. So he took and he calls the, it Blazor. Blazor is the working name right now. But it's some, meant to be some amalgamation of like Razor and browser and something else. Um, so he he took something called .NET Anywhere, I think Doa, um, which was a it's a C port. It's a port right. of the .NET runtime written in C. Yeah, it's an older uh, thing. It was called it's DNA. Old, it's like five it years like, old. It's like a Silverlight, like an open source Silverlight, like a it's, mono it's, Silverlight. It's it's kind of more like Rota, I would say. Like it's a totally separate implementation. Right. It's in, so aspect. it's interesting that you say that because I've been doing the whole explanation of .NET standard, and I have the three boxes. You know, the .NET full framework, .NET Core, .NET, and then Mono. Those are instances yep. of .NET. There are rarely other instances to point out. Yes. But that's a perfect yes. example. Like .NET Anywhere, yes. it's an instance of .NET that you don't know about. And if they decide to be .NET standard 
compliant, then more power to them. There might yeah. we might wake up tomorrow with a half dozen or more instances of right. .NET. And yeah, exactly. Just like you see. In so Java what if you could make other. the browser, yeah, .NET standard compliant? Right, and so that's what you know. WebAssembly is is the ability to. Well, we've talked about it before. It's a subset of JavaScript, which is with native support in the browser for receiving code in a byte for like a binary format rather than in sort of JavaScript source code format. Um, so you can avoid a lot of the performance issues with large JavaScript payloads. Um, and then it's it's optimized because it's not the full JavaScript scope. It's a subset. And then there's, it's very much still a work in progress. The browser manufacturers are all working together with the community right now to determine how to do certain things in WASM or WebAssembly. Um, anyway, so he, he successfully put together a prototype that he was able to demo that's up on his GitHub repo that enables you to write pages in Razor, very similar to Razor pages in ASP.NET Core 2, um, and write your code in C Sharp, um, and take normal .NET IL assemblies, like standard .NET IL assemblies, they get downloaded to the browser and interpreted. There's an IL interpreter in Blazor um, so that it can run normal .NET uh, assemblies, assuming they have you know the APIs are satisfied in the in the runtime that's running in the in the browser, uh, and you know you write an app, so you write you you write what kind of looks like a Razor app. I mean, it's effectively a SPA, but instead of using Angular and TypeScript, you're using Razor and C Sharp. And so right. it's pretty cool. Um, so it doesn't go as far as Silverlight, obviously, where you had a completely different UI stack, which is like Silverlight was right. more like, let's use the canvas and then have an ActiveX control or you yeah. know, plug See, I always thought I always thought Silverlight was, when I first saw Silverlight way back in the day, I didn't think that the UI stuff was that interesting. Mm. I always, and I, when I use Silverlight in my projects, I made a little one pixel by one pixel yeah. Silverlight. And you used the DOM bridge. And I used the DOM bridge and I had a little engine. Yeah. And now here we are again. Yes. You know, you could have just as easily, from a computer science perspective, taken C sharp and run it as Java bytecode and then run it right. with Java VM. Right. All of this underscores the idea that the virtual machine is now built into the browser. Right. It's totally competent. Right. WebAssembly is the target. Yep. So I think we're going to see a day where someone can file a new project, anything. Yep, and then just target WebAssembly downstream. It'd yeah, be, uh, potentially. And, and as I said, like it's still uh, in its infancy, and there's a lot of features missing from WebAssembly. Yeah, yeah. To really... I don't mean that from an ASP.NET perspective. I was I... imagining someone taking a Unity game or a yeah. C game and then saying, "I'm just going to target WebAssembly." And actually, uh, advertisement. Please check out my podcast. I had the vice president of engineering, now technical fellow at Mozilla, mm. on two weeks ago talking about WebAssembly. Nice. If you want to hear about WebAssembly from one of the leaders in the space, cool. that would be the person to talk to. So anyway, that, that demo has, um, as you can imagine, um, uh, uh, seeded a lot of discussion. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at it. We haven't made any decision about you know, any immediate goals or plans to invest in that a little more. Obviously, we, we, if, we were, if Microsoft was going to do something, we'd probably utilize our own .NET assets, not some random .NET implementation on GitHub. Uh, so Steve kind of proved um, he built a prototype so that we could, so that people could see what an app model built on C Sharp and Razor that runs natively in the browser would look like. But obviously, to build a product around that is an awful lot more work. Like you know, we're talking many, many, many months or even years. Um, but it's it, it's it's created a conversation. I'm be fully open. Like so, we're you know we're we're kind of looking at it on the side right now. Like obviously, we're busy doing .NET Core two and those type of things right now. But um, yeah, you know, stay tuned. Um, and uh, if you're interested in that, I encourage people to look at Sanderson's GitHub repo. And you can just clone it and run it. It just runs. And like he said, it all set up really nicely so that the the server side part of the app has a development server that runs in the app. So that while you're developing C sharp in your Razor files that are being rendered in the browser, the server app keeps running and it recompiles the Razor on the fly and redelivers it back to the browser without you having to refresh. So you get that nice kind of Angular or React hot module reloading type of experience, that live reload experience, like out of the box. Um, mm -hmm. But you're writing C Sharp and it's all running the browser. It's really quite cool. Um, so who knows? Who knows where that'll end up? Um, but you know, I just wanted to say, that, yeah, we, you know, Steve did a thing and we're looking at it and uh, it's created a little bit of excitement around here. So, uh, but in the meantime, we're obviously busy doing our day jobs and that's uh, shipping.net core too. <laughs> um, just as a point of note here, mm. I am slapping spam bots down like mm. just. Unreal. Have we made it? Have we arrived? I was about to say, does that mean that we've act we're a thing now and people are waiting for us to go live and then just coming in? And I just can't believe And the part that I don't understand is how does this work? Do you. I don't know. Like, I mean, do, do, you we, make, uh, do you make your own account? I thought Google. How do you prevent Google, it? 
I thought Google went out of their way to make people use their real names and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe there's some features that we can turn on when we create the live stream that makes the chat harder to enter. Like, you have to do an extra step. I'm not sure. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't yeah. understand functionally how they do this. No, neither do I. I mean, uh, I can see right now there are four different um, bots with the same avatar in there right now. Uh, there's been us. 20. And they keep uh, coming back. Like, yeah, I guess. And, and, they just, they're, and they're generating the same last name. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, blocked them. I blocked every single one of them. If mm -hmm. I missed one, you should be able now to click on the little dot, dot, dot in the chat. Oh, really? And hit block. I made you the... If, yeah, if you logged in, it's who you're logged in as. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, I took your Damien Edwards eighty four account, and you have like a YouTube account. Do I? Oh. I have. To, I, I can't. Do, I can't make a user. I can't make a random user a YouTube moderator. I have to make them a. Um, yeah, I still can't do anything. I can only make a person with a YouTube account. I see. Okay, so I don't know what the difference is, but okay. I have to go. But in, yep, as we too. as we head out the door. Yeah, Here is so, so in the in the ten minutes that it took us to be chatting, uh, it updated from two point one to three. Very so good. It's quite quite not a big deal. Yeah, um, I can am continually impressed with this. And there are a lot of if you're using a ASP.NET Core or a .NET Core, there are a lot of tooling improvements in that version. So uh, do I did product. I get a new version? No, of, no, no. Remember as, as we announced at Build, the .NET Core two pieces are separate from Visual Studio. You have to install them separately. And as I mentioned just before, Preview 2 of .NET Core 2 isn't out yet. We're, we're this close. We're super, super close. Should I go, now that I have updated to Preview 3, should I go over here and, and build? Get, yes. get And I can tell you what build will be the one that's released. And where do I do? Do I go down here? It's, it'll be in the RHEL. Preview two branch, go up to the down. There you Not go. this one. No, up pre release that one. Preview two is the one that's going to be coming out imminently, and the build should be preview two dash zero zero six four nine seven. Six four nine seven. Yeah, which is not that one. So that build has obviously spat out a new one since then, but that's not the one we're. So going we to will update all these pages. Well, this page obviously you won't use this page to get preview two when it's actually out. You'll just get it from the normal download site. Um, okay. But you, you can um, How would if you I look at the table or the, the like the installer link on that page. Oh, and just, then yeah, the preview number is not it's not six five zero two. It's is the one that will ship is six four nine seven. Is my current understanding? That's the one. Yeah, I'm using. That's the what problem I is there's not. I don't think you'll have a link. You'll have to create the link. Oh, it's latest. I'll have to actually. I'd have to actually give you the the naming, uh, like the, the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they don't make that as easy as perhaps it could be. Well, they're going they're going dot latest to be convenient. Yeah, and that that is a later build than what will actually be shipped. So, yep. releases. Yeah, there's no good way to unless it's tagged. So I should just wait a couple of days. Yeah, I mean, if you just if you wait a couple of days, you'll just be able to go to the dot.net site and download the preview, right? And that'll All be right, cool. the, it'll be that build. Yeah. But for now, this is fine. Yeah, for now, what you've got is fine. All right, cool. Yeah. There's Blazer right there. Cool. All right. All right, cool. Zoom out. See y'all later. Been a while. Are you gonna kinda All gonna right, here we go. Oh wow. Is that the end? That was horrible. That... My god. A nightmare. Oh, let me zoom in a bit. What is on your shirt? Oh, that's the BMW M uh, logo. Okay. Not, not affiliated All right, with Let's me get rid of these slack. Not these slack. Get these spam people out of here. <laughs> See ya. See ya.